All right, go ahead and take your hymnal. Stand, turn to 249. 249, nothing but the blood. 249. about it, but aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin? Amen. Let's pray. Well, we come to you tonight and we thank you again for your shed blood on the cross of Calvary for uh, the remission of our sins. And uh, Lord, thankful for you staying the course. Pray tonight as we study your word or we just be encouraged and edified and exhorted, Lord, to do what your word commands us. Lord, help us to grow in grace Lord, but grow nonetheless. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <coughs> yeah. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. Second Thessalonians chapter number two. Man, it is pretty out this side. It is distracting. We stepped out of the house. I was like, man, it is it's nice out. Real nice. But, nonetheless, you're here for God's Word. You have to be in the mood for this stuff. Second Thessalonians, chapter number 2. I was thinking when we were leaving, I was like, I have to be in the mood to teach on this stuff. It, it, is, uh, it almost is a, uh, not a distraction, but a sidestep from just regular preaching teaching through first and second Thessalonians there is a uh, there are lots of error I'm not and I'm not going to sit here I believe what I believe and I believe I can support that with the scripture there is a lot of error that's coming about at the church at Thessalonica uh, they are they are confused and we will read this in the language as we're reading and starting in chapter number two chapter number one is always that introductory there's only three chapters very short letter but it's one of the most influential books, 2 Thessalonians, most influential books concerning the end times and the language of that, of that end times and what Paul is trying to do. It, it would appear by the length of the letter 
that Paul didn't spend much time at Thessalonica. Just five chapters in, in, uh, in the first letter, three chapters in the second letter. So very short letters. And I don't think Paul undersold them. I, I think one of the things that we must do when, we're, when we are studying God's Word is I, I try to draw myself into the perspective. That's what I try to do. I try to, I try to make myself a Thessalonican what was taking place what are the circumstances surrounding what is being said? And obvious that one of those circumstances was they did not have the complete canon of Scripture. I think you and I, we're not held to a higher standard when it comes to, to serving God, but there is obviously an, an opportunity that we have to be exposed to God's Word versus uh, a, a type of revelation that we would have seen in the book of Acts. Like Paul was literally writing this, these letters post being establishing the church so what was it that he taught if you guys were to come tonight and you and and so for the next let's just say let's say one year the next 12 months we meet three times a week we're going to establish church i'm going to teach you everything that you need to know to run the church i'll be back in five years i mean think about how much you just forget in your common everyday learning i mean everybody would be we say taking notes, that's easy today. I mean, back then, what would they have been scratching on? They all have their little ink quills out, their feathers and, and dipping pots and uh, writing on parchment paper and taking... No, their memory was their note. And really, we, as we read the Scripture, we find out that, that the Holy Spirit would have been their driving force. And that's why... In First John, in chapter, in First John, it says, "Test the spirits." Like they were, they were taking the spirits, and they were putting them up against uh, how how what was perceived. What did it say? Did it profess Christ? Did it profess man? Did it profess? And if it didn't, they were to cast it out or turn away from it. And so you and I have. We're going to go back at whatever I'm taught tonight. We all don't even probably believe the same. And we have the canon of Scripture. And if there was four or five different people could get up and teach, they would teach something completely different from what is taught here. And that, that leads to perception too, and we will see that. Let's read the first... Um, I, think, uh, I think I pushed myself into verse number 7, so let's read down that far. He says, Now we beseech you. The word beseech, I, I like that word. Uh, it's found in Romans 12, 1 as well. It just means to beg or to implore or draw, draw us to. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together in Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You can see there's a, almost every verse is, is quoted in regular preaching uh, in this portion of Scripture. Who opposeth the son of perdition, he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he has so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that? See, there's that word. Remember not? Remember what I told you? I mean, if if Roger goes to the grocery toilet, does he always remember everything that you tell him to get? Do you make a list? Does he make a list? I mean, okay, all right, but but just trying to it is those odd things though. That's what I mean. It's a, it's the odd thing that throws it off. I'm telling you tonight. Nathan bought me a little case knife. At least I think he did. He told me he did uh, from Knife Works. Is that the place? What what's it called? Smoky Mountain Knife Works down in in Tennessee. He bought me a little case knife. I wear. I wear a wallet and a cell phone. That's what I wear all the time. Tonight I picked this knife up, put it in my pocket. When I left, I walked out, I had two things. Like my mind said, you're good to go. I stepped out the door and I was like, and I had that. I don't know if you do this, but I knew. 
something was off. And when, as I stood there, I was like, what am I forgetting? I was like, oh yeah, I put my phone in my left pocket and I pulled out the knife and I was like, I don't even have my phone. But, I'm, but that's how I'm plugged. Uh, I put, man, my, from yesterday, my tennis elbow is singing. And I don't even know what that is. And I'm just presuming I've gotten it since COVID. And so I put that brace on. And when, when I did, I, when I put the brace on, I was like, I'm going to forget something. Because it's a garment that I'm not used to being clothed in. I mean, he, he would have said, he says, remember? Well, that remembering is only as good as our memory. And how we categorize the importance of it. Roger's like, we need eggs. We need eggs. And they eat a lot of eggs. He eats a lot of eggs. We, she, so if Twyla says, we need eggs, he's like, I got that one. I was already thinking about that. We need, and if she was to say something that maybe she needed that he doesn't have an interest in, you know, the importance will be the fact that she needs it. But really, when you get to the store, because it lacks importance, it does not rise to the level in our mind of what we have to get. It's that, it's that thing always when I get home, Marcia say, did you get, and I'm just like... And I'll look and I'll look at Sam or Nathan and say, I told you that we could not forget that. And they're just like, oh, I just thought maybe you didn't want to buy it. You know, and I was like, you didn't remind me? Well, no, I was... Caleb was our rememberer, you know, and so he was the Pete repeat. You know, hey, don't forget to tell us to get this. We go down the road and he'd just be saying it over and over and over. But he says, remember in verse 5, <coughs> remember you not <coughs> that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you, know what, uh, now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Verse 7, very, very interesting verse. Very interesting phraseology. I think we, can, I think we, we in practice, we know what it means. But tonight, we're going to look at it. I've got, I have... I have notes, but I have the written down notes. So it's not preachy. I shouldn't get too off track, and we'll get through this. Uh, I, I talk. I just titled chapter two, verses one through seven. Uh, Paul is clarifying the end times. What's what title did I give you, uh, Ethan? Chaos and, Chaos and deception. That's what I put. Chaos and deception. Who is the master of that? Satan is the master of that. Chaos. In deception. What was happening? They were very frantic. And there was chaos in deception. Paul was getting a report back that, hey man, they, some things need to be straightened out up there. You know, if, if we, if, when we left our home and, and Savannah was there, Savannah and Caleb and the twins and, and uh, Sam, and we would say, they would want to know who's in charge. Like, who has the final say-so? That, that we're going to be gone, they want to know. Who... Ha, who's in charge? Caleb's like, I am the man, you know, and these are my brothers and sisters. Savannah's like, I'm older than you and, can, and I can knock you out, you know, and so they want to know, they wanted our authority to put them, their authority in charge. When they were growing up and it was Nathan and Grace, because they're twins, Grace would be like, I'm older than you by about 45 seconds. So I'm in charge. He'd be like, I'm bigger than you. I'm, I'm in charge. And People wanted to know who was in charge. So in here, without, without, a, without a structure, there is chaos. And if people are just left to themselves, you know, it's every man for themselves. If that's the order, you can imagine on a sinking ship, if the captain was just come on and say, every man for himself, you know, it would just be utter chaos. They have a plan. They're bringing up the, say, the, the, uh, the boats. They're putting people in. We're going to put women and children. We're going to put them down. We're, you know, we have a process. And the captain's going to do what? He's going to go down with the boat. You know, he's, he's captain in the ship to the last moment. He's making sure every person is off. There's order that's going to take place. So Paul says, don't you remember? Now imagine if I said that to you. Hey, remember five years ago when we were talking about this? Let's get together and have a group discussion. Pastor called me the other day and he said, uh, I'm thinking about they're going to do a project in their basement. Aaron, Aaron's maybe going to do that project. And he said, I'm thinking about uh, getting all of the ladies in the church together and asking them what kind of flooring they would like to put down. And I was like, that's the end of your ministry. Like, it's been nice knowing you. Don't move too far away. Hope you pastor somewhere close so we can still be friends. 
And he was like, what? And I said, do not. Do not do that. And I said, pick out the three that maybe your wife likes. Bring that before them and say, which three? I was like, you can set up boxes. They can vote. They can. But do not just say, what do you guys think that we should do? I was like, you literally, if you have 80, you'll have 80 opinions. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the truth of it. We all have different likes and interests. You know, guys would just stand back, you know, and be like, is long, they don't want to make the decision. You know, all four of us get into a truck to go to lunch, and you would think that the hot potato was deciding, the guy that decides we're going to eat is going to die. Because nobody will decide. Where do you want to eat? You're driving. I picked the other day. You pick. No, I'm not picking this time. I picked. You pick. You pick. You pick. Let's go here. I don't want to eat there. What's what, you know, there's, a guy's not going to make any decision at all when it comes to that stuff. What color carpet? Like, we don't care what color the carpet is. We just... Yeah, give us the project, let it be functional, and let us, let us get it down. And so they are, he's writing, they're trying to, or they're expressing their memory, and so he's writing a letter to restore these truths. So something that had been taught, really in a short letter, he's just skipping a rock. Remember these things. Let's set those back in order. So I've got, I think next week finishes, but I, tonight I've got the error... Uh, the, the error about eschatology or end times and uh, the enlightenment about end times. And so he reveals some truth. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, number 1, the concerns from the error. Because of Paul's short ministry in Thessalonica, the new converts, though taught well, still had many questions. Man, hey, let's be honest. Do you still have many questions about end time events? Some of you have been in the Bible for years. Still have questions about end time events. As events unfold, you know, there's clearer revelation at times. There are still tons of questions. There are tons of teachings. So there still is question. They had question. Let's delve into and see why they were having these questions. Whether truth is taught, error, where truth is taught, error will soon be present to try and counter the truth. Number one, the concerns for error. We beseech you, brethren, by the kingdom of Lord Jesus and the gathering of us together. Two things that were being here taught in error. The, the return of the Lord, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when and if He had already come. We can denote that from, from the teaching here. They believed, and I may be running ahead of myself, but they believed that Christ had already come back and they had been left behind. One of the things that we've talked about about the church in Thessalonica is they were under great persecution and the day of the Lord and the day of Christ, and we're going to look at those, were a time when the day of Christ is when the Christ was going to take, to take the church and the day of the Lord was a time when the Lord was going to judge the people left on earth. And there were people that were teaching the day of Christ had already taken place. The day of the Lord was at hand and they were under judgment and there were persecution and the persecution had raised to a level where there were those who were being martyred and they felt as if they had been left out. And, and Paul is clarifying these things. Look, you have not been left out. I mean, if the, he says later, if any man lives godly in Christ Jesus, he or she shall suffer persecution. Persecution is going to come. You guys, do you guys sense the persecution in the change uh, uh, in America? That persecution is going to come. I believe persecution... Uh, already exists. It exists around the world, but we're seeing it being practiced in America. And we can say by a people group or in certain states, beloved, uh, I think Ed taught this this morning, don't, we have to be compassionate for the sinner. The sinner before salvation is just the tool or workman of the cause of Satan. Satan is imploring or trying to put forth his model to the people and putting forth that model, he's using people to do that. We get angry with people when we should be angry about sin. 
And so when we get angry with people, it's hard to be compassionate to them or about them or for them. If, if I was to say, I want you to write a list of five people down right now that you think if, if they were just taken from the world would make the world a better place. We have names. We have names. And rightfully, some of those names would make the world a better place. But I'll say this, as soon as they were gone, Satan's got somebody to fill in for him right away. He's got substitutes everywhere for that group of people. So we must keep our eyes focused on the prize, not on the chaos. So we see the concerns in the air, the return of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, when and if He had already come. Some teaching, some teaching He had, there were those there that were teaching He had already come. And, and uh, they had missed the catching away. And this is why the persecution was so great. So we see the return. We see the reunion. Our gathering together under Him. They feared that they had missed it. Look back, you don't have to look back. Back in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, the Bible says, Then they which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. And they, they were, they, I, they didn't, I don't, believe, I don't believe that they believed they had missed that from the actual persecution. I believe they believe they missed that of, from the next verses because there were people teaching that. We talked this morning <coughs> at length. Maybe, maybe I've ran it out too long about Willis and his cast iron skillet. Look, if Willis talks about that cast iron skillet, how great it is, Roger talks about how great that cast iron skillet is. When you go to the store to buy a skillet and a cast iron skillet is one that's available, you are influenced by their teaching. You're influenced by their experience. You're influenced by what, what you have heard. And that in that is that faith cometh by hearing. We are influenced by the things that we hear. And so they stand there. They're not making a decision just based totally upon what they believe they're making a decision based on what others have taught them now has developed their belief. And so if you had, if I had two or three people, think about pre-access uh, to the internet. If I had two or three people in a, in a, in a uh, uh, rural uh, congregation and we began to teach the same thing, I began to teach it, Aaron began to teach it, Wills began to teach it, the Sunday school teachers began to teach it, wouldn't be long before that teaching was adopted and then our children would grow up thinking that that is fact, although it may be false. And so as they began to teach this, there were those that began to say, you know what, there's some validity to it. You know, John got martyred last week for his belief. And all somebody would have to say is, man, you think the Lord left us behind? And then Ed would say, hey, I was with this group of guys the other day and Andrew said the Lord left us behind. Man, that's not what he said. But that's what Ed says that he said. Then Ed tells Linda, Linda calls somebody and tells them. And before you know it, you got a group of people saying, hey, we've been left behind. How do you know that? Well, the Lord said, we've been left behind. You want to give validity to your argument. Look, every time, it, it makes me nervous. I don't laugh at nobody that says this. But when people tell me that the Lord told them something that is unscriptural, I'm always like, mm, I wonder what Lord that was. Lowercase L Lord of this world? You know, our capital L Lord of all of creation. Because that's contrary to what His Word teaches. See, you and I have a tool that we can use people's teaching to litmus test against they had what they remembered what paul had taught and they did have the holy spirit i'm not going to discredit what the holy spirit can do i'm, I'm just being i'm just being honest with you i didn't know everything about parenting before we had kids i don't know everything about parenting now but because i had been with jesus the holy spirit could guide me into truth about rearing kids that i don't know if i'm sensitive to him now i believe i should be educating and pursuing those truths. But at the same time, just following God's Spirit. But, I don't, but, but on the flip side, I've had people tell me over the years, God's Spirit's teaching them something that's contrary to what God's Word is teaching too. And I'm like, that's no, Holy Spirit's not teaching you something contrary to God's Word. He only teaches you. It's in the Bible. 
of whom Jesus is. So there were concerns over the error, the return and the reunion. There were consequences of the error. Error had an adverse effect upon the Thessalonican believers. They were two things. They were disturbed. They were shaken in mind. Doctrinal error does not calm people. It upsets them. You know why it upsets Christians? Because it's contrary to the Holy Spirit that's in you. It agitates the peace. Look, when I preach a truth and the Spirit in you bears witness with that truth that it is from the Word of God, we can agree and all say, Amen. We can agree. When you preach a doctrinal deviation and I come to the point and I do it with emphasis, stomp my foot, slap my hands and say, Amen. Somebody will respond, Amen. But some of you are like, I don't know. Amen. I don't know about that. Preacher, we want to support you, but I don't know about that. Because it agitates the Spirit. So they were agitated. I think there were things they remembered that Paul had taught, but now they were being taught these contrary things, and they were beginning to, to gain traction, and all of a sudden they were, they were beginning to think, is there truth in this? Hath God said? Did He say? Did Paul teach? What did He say? We better find out. So they are disturbed and they're discom discomforted. Shaken in mind and trouble are two words that are, that are nearly the same word. So when a, when a commentator writes, these two words mean the same thing, then I always think, why did God say it twice? And I believe He just says it twice because it was double of what one would have. And so he says, they are shaken in mind and they are troubled. There is, there is not a great deal of difference between the meanings of shaken mind and trouble. It took away their peace and hopes and brought uncertainty. You know what preaching should do? Give us certainty. It should bear witness with our spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The preaching of God's word should bear witness. It should be like beholding that glass. We're looking in the face of preaching or the face of God's truth with the Holy Spirit looking at the, at the face of that truth, and they should look the same. They should be a mirror image of one another, and that should bring peace. If you, when you walked into your bathroom in the morning, look, not getting all uh, strange on you, but if you walked in the bathroom and you looked in the mirror and there was you and there was somebody else in the mirror, but there was nobody there, you would be troubled. It would trouble you. If you walk up to a mirror, you know, I look, I look back in... I'm like, how, how did they live? You look at mirrors back in the day or a shined up piece of tin and they look and like it's not a clear presentation of who the individual was. If you would look in the mirror and, there was, and, the, and, the, and the particle had pulled away from the glass and there was two of you, you wouldn't put up with that mirror very long because it would just, you just would be like, I don't have, well, I'm an American, I don't have to, I'll just buy a new one. But most of you would be like, why would anybody look in a mirror like that? It would trouble us. Error is not in the business of bringing comfort to the hearers. It brings chaos. You know what happens when I... When I I, I, and I may, I may cross over here into something that, that the Holy Spirit would have to speak to your heart about. You know how I can create control in my house? Create chaos. If I lack control in my house and I create chaos, I can say, everybody come to me. And then I will dictate control. And there are people that parent like that. I didn't pre-say that because I think somebody in here is doing it. But as you watch people in your life, you will notice some of them have control and there's nothing but chaos around them all the time. Everything they do, everywhere they go, they sow seeds of discord and they sow seeds of chaos so then they can be in control. And that's what Satan does. If I can scatter the masses... If the sheep are to be in this field where the shepherd is and I can scatter the sheep, I can go over here, mimic the voice of the shepherd, call them to me, dress like a shepherd, talk like a shepherd, but then have control over what would be God's sheep. And so in the chaos, to me it's a character flaw in humanity. When someone tries to control people through chaos, 
through the rumor mill, I'm going to keep myself elevated, eventually runs its course because, the, because be sure your sin will find you out. But in the process, we can say, hey man, be sure your sin will find you out. That's true. Praise the Lord. Hey, there will be people that will be destroyed in that chaos. Look, I'm not trying to stir chaos at Car Township Baptist Church so we can have control. Look, we're looking at the world. It's in chaos. In here, our spirit should just bear witness with the preaching of God's Word where we can come together and be edified, educated, encouraged, go in the world and evangelize. And those E's were not written down. That, that works pretty good. So disturbed and discomforted. If Satan <clears throat> cannot keep you from being saved, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, what's the next best thing? Create chaos amongst the saved. Create division amongst the saved. I was with somebody yesterday and they walked up to me. I knew something was on their heart. They walked up to me and said, how's church going? How's things doing? This is a person that hardly ever speaks. Very quiet human being. And he began to talk to me, and, and uh, we, were, we were talking about it. He was like, how's your building? You guys think about building a new building project? And I used the idea of carpet just because that was on my mind. That's what he said. And he said, well, I'll never tell you one thing about churches. And I was like, oh, he's about to tell me somewhere where he's been hurt. And I said, what's up? And he goes, do not, uh, don't, don't let nobody pick the, the floor covering. Just go get it and put it in. And don't let nobody have any say on it. People are more worried about floor covering than they are the preaching of God's Word. I mean, and I was like, somebody's been hurt. Somebody's been hurt. Somebody's been through a split. But wouldn't it be shallow of us, and I'm not setting you up for something, but for us to split over the covering color of a floor in a building that's one day, but you know that's the way Satan works. That's how he works. People can't get over their own opinions and who they are and the influence that they have. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Great peace. Peace. Look, the mature believer should be able to say, it just don't matter. That just don't matter. If, if, I don't like red, but if, if red made you come to church when the doors were open and serve the Lord, I'm all about us getting red. I, mean, I don't care what I walk on in here. I do not care if people will serve the Lord. If changing the floor covering would make people more godly, I'm all for it. But, but you see how shallow that is in our uh, walk with God. So they were discomforted. The consequences of error, we see the corruption in the error. Error is never distinguished by good character, but it always associates with corruption. Let me put a space in here while I'm doing this. We note four ways in which the, the uh, propagation of this error, the promoting of this error, evidenced corruption. We see the divulgence. How, what was the first one? Uh, let's, I'll, I'll get you there. Verse number uh, 2. He says, "...that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or troubled." Neither by spirit, lowercase s. We have to be careful with punctuation. Neither by spirit. Don't be troubled or, sh or soon shaken in mind. That's a tongue twister for me. By spirit. An angel told me. Man, I was working a poll for a... a for a presidential election down in Jeffersonville. There were a husband and wife and another lady and myself, and I was the, whatever, the judge. And they, be, they found out that I was a pastor. You would not believe the questions that they ask. And then the conversations that they had. One time an angel came down from heaven, flew next to me and spoke to me in my... My ear. Who disputes that stuff? What was I going to say? That didn't happen. I was a demon. You know? Angels don't do that. Just reveal themselves. They don't do it in the Bible. You know? So, what in the, what in the world? Look, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, spiritual wickedness. 
Somebody says to me, they're like, I went to a fortune teller. They named people and places and things and stuff that was going on. Do you believe in that stuff? I'm like, nope. Well, how did they know the names? I'm like, the devil literally hears you say it and those demons speak to these people that are in divination, walking with them hand in hand. They lock themselves into the, to the realm of darkness and they begin to say a name that... no, There's no way she could have known that name. But the devil knows that name. And the demons know that name. But we ought not to practice that nonsense, man. It's very dangerous. You know, it's, they have the prayer booth right down at the uh, Harvest Homecoming, right next to the tarot reading card. You know, people are going in and making a profession of faith and going right over and having their palms read. And I'm like, it is light in darkness, and these two have no concord with, with <coughs> one another. Satan and Bilal, they are, they are just as far apart as they should ever be, but in the world, man, they get real close. What's your... What's your if I said horoscope, what is the thing that is the month that you were born? What is that? Um, your horoscope, your sign? Yeah. What's your sign? Well, a Pisces can't be with a... I don't even know another one. Because of their attitude and how they mix. And the, this people born in February are of a hot temper. People born in August are, are laid back. And they will never work out. And I'm just like, what in the world? Where would you read all that? Moving on. So there's a spirit. Here means some divulging of truth through supernatural means. False teachers were claiming extra revelation. Yeah, Paul taught these things, but then the Lord spoke to me and said, and began to fill in the blank. Look, I, I may not be able to get that over on you. But if Aaron or Willis did that with the kids downstairs, and especially if they could pull those kids away from other adults, and they begin to say, why? They have a position of influence and authority. You know, if, there was, if, the, if the person that we hero worship in the ministry showed up and began to say, hey, God's been speaking to me in an unusual way, I, I could probably agree, well, praise the Lord. How is that? Well, it's extra biblical. Like, he's given me stuff beyond the scope of the Scriptures. You know, if we're he were worshiping them, or we, they have a place of influence in our life, all of a sudden, we're going to begin to, hmm. You know, there, there's Jeff, a new convert in Christ, and, and I get up here and begin to teach false doctrine. John may go home and say, I don't know about everything that he's teaching. Jeff could say, yeah, but I went in and he led me to Christ. Like He has a major influence over my life. Eddie had a major influence over my life when I was a newborn babe in Christ. And so the Bible warns, Be not thou many teachers, for theirs is a greater condemnation. Be very careful the foundation that you build on once it's laid. Be very careful. The Spirit must be understood in the light of the fact that the early church expected supernatural communication. See, that was a problem. They did not have the Bible. So people could easily slide in and say, the Spirit told me this, the angel told me that, you know, the Lord said this, Jesus revealed Himself in a vision and said that. Look, if somebody had come in today and said there was a burning bush and I took my shoes off and went on because I was walking over, we would say, what in the world are you crazy? But Moses did that back in those times and this was pra common practice with with demons and those kind of things, and how the Lord revealed Himself to man. Without the entire Bible we have today, this sort of problem would, would be more prevalent. <laughs> I say that. <laughs> it's as prevalent as it's ever been. It's crazy. We have the Bible, and it's as prevalent as it's ever been. It's maybe more prevalent now than it was in, in God's day. People are less biblical, but more spiritual than they've ever been. They're connected to the earth, to the things of the earth, to, to different things. And they have this spiritual vibe that's going on between them and the things going on. So we see the divulgence, we see the declaration. He says, troubled in spirit, nor by word. Well, I had a word the other day. I watched the church service the other night. I mean, I, this is somebody that I know, not in our circle, thank goodness. 
I called a pastor friend of mine that we're in the know together of this guy, and I said, hey, have you seen this? Go to his service, turn up to 22 minutes and 33 seconds, and what is going on? And he just did this. Eddie, come forward. Eddie, won't you come up? I have a word to speak over you today. I see money in your future. I see a heart of giving. Eddie, you love the Lord. I can tell, I can feel that. I can sense that presence in you. I see building going on here, and I see God using you to do that. Let's have a word of prayer. I was like, what did he just... I'm doing that. <laughs> John, come up here. Let's have a... <laughs> but I was like, what? In... Neither by spirit nor by word. Look, that's, that's a position of great authority. He calls a man up in a, in a large city church in front of a congregation, puts his hand on him, begins to speak, I'm going to speak a word over you. I mean, I was looking, and Marcy was like, what is he doing? I was like, I don't, I have no idea. So I called him, I called this guy, and he answered, he said, hey, honey, he's a chaplain with me. He said, hey, this is Pastor Ball, the guy I tell you about sometimes. It's kind of funny. I'm going to put you on speakerphone, preacher. And he puts me on speakerphone. He goes, go ahead. So I go over there. Both of them are like, what in the world? And he goes, did you know this about him? I'm like, I, I mean, I had no idea. No idea. So nor by word. We see the declaration in the corruption by word. This refers to oral teaching or preaching or pu public proclamation. Error seems to always have gifted speakers who can promote error in a clever way rhetoric. I, I'm just being honest with you. There are guys out there that are far better speakers than I will ever be. But I'm like, you need to listen to what they say. They have been given some kind of grace in their tongue by, with speaking. But what they say is not true. And I will hear people say, he or she is a great speaker. I'm like, listen to what they say. You literally can Google errors in their preaching and thousands of quotes will come up that are errors. And what will happen if they're confronted? How do you feel about this? They'll just deny it. Well, that's not what I meant there. That's what you said there. It's like they do the politic thing on us today. The president says something, no matter which president, then the spokesperson comes out and clarifies what he said. I'm like, I know exactly what he said because it came out of his mouth. If he didn't want to say it, then he shouldn't have said it. Well, he just repeats what's on the teleprompter. That's a whole other ballgame. The deceit by letter from us. You know what they said? I've got a letter. Church at Thessalonica, they're sitting in their pews, and the leadership was saying, we got a letter from Paul. Here's what he said. Right, guys? Yep, got this the other day. Let's read it. And they began to read what Paul had written to them, although Paul had never written it. He said, no, I'll teach you what I want you to know when I'm there. Look, if you get a letter, Timothy or someone like that will bring it and they will stay with you and make sure that it's executed in the manner by which I wrote it. We're not going to send a secret letter by night so somebody can just give their own teaching. So we see the, the declaration of co corruption. We see the deceit and the corruption by letter from us. Deceive you. Deception is always <coughs> part of error. Besides the notation of it, an illustration is given. And then we see the diversity. Deceived by any means. He writes there in verse number 2, By word, nor by letter from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Any means. Don't be deceived. Take the, you'd be better off to know ten things well than to know a hundred things loosely. And, and that's a common, that's a, that's a teaching that we're, we're instilling. Don't spread yourself so thin you can't do something that God's called you to do well. Because that's what Satan will do. He will spread you like butter. And they may all be ministry things, but you'd be spread so thin that you're not effective anywhere. 
Look, don't forget what God has asked you to do. Put yourself there. You can extend some, but you and I, we're not God. And nor if somebody was to say, some of people would say to me, well, how busy are you? The, the busyness is unrelenting. And there, and there isn't, there could be a hundred of me and, it, and I couldn't get all of the work done. So I have to just get the work done that I can and be satisfied with that and ask God to put His blessing on it. So He says, not by any means. Third, third this may be fourth. The, yeah, fourth. Corruption error, the creed in the error. The special problem that error had caused was a mistaken view of the time of revelation, namely, when Christ would come back to earth to reign. See two things, the rendering in the text. The day of Christ is at hand in verse number 2. The day of the Lord is a term which means, uh, which refers to the revelation or refers to the judgment of God. We are in the day of the Lord, but the day of the Lord is going to be here and He's going to do it. He's going to judge mankind. Here we see the language, the day of Christ. There's a lot of dispute over, the, of, over this one verse and phrase. Uh, in the religious world. The day of Christ is a term that refers to the catching away, this man being moved from here out. The rendering, the ramification is at hand. Is at hand means it has come, it has arrived. So he says there in, in verse number 2, nor by spirit nor letter of us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Don't be soon shaken in mind by these things as if the day of Christ has already come to pass. The day of Christ is at hand. It has already happened. They were being taught it had already come. I mean, what, what was 1 Thessalonians for then? When he was correcting, they were worried about what in 1 Thessalonians? The, the dead. What's going to happen to the dead? Some were teaching that the dead would not resurrect, that you had to be alive whenever uh, Christ returned so you could be caught away. And he said, and he said, and he began to teach there in chapter 4 uh, about those that are dead. The trump, the uh, uh, voice of an archangel will step out, and those that are dead shall be caught away first, and we which are alive and shall be caught up in the air together with them to, forever to be with, be with the Lord. We will not prevent, is what the Bible says, we will not prevent those that are Asleep. This idea would be very upsetting to the Thessalonians, for they were assured from Paul's teaching that they would escape this day because of this taking out the day of the Lord. It would be a time of great judgment. Furthermore, the error would also cause them to think they had missed what we use the language, the rapture, but the catching away, and that would cause them to question their salvation and increase their concern about the saints who had already died. So he gives the correction in verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There's a lot to be said about this verse. I have my, I have my own positions on, on these teachings. Verse 4 says, Who opposeth, exalt himself of all the call God, or what is worship? We, we all probably agree on that, that Satan is going to do that. He's going to sit on the throne of God, declaring himself to be God. That's what he's going to do. And so that he, that he as God sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We see the great apostasy must occur. And, and I've taught on apostasy recently a lot. Apostasy is a complete reversal of a, of a former belief. So we are seeing Christians, we, we are seeing them daily apostatize. I mean, guys that have, that have been... Called, surrendered, school, place, pastored, they're out. And many times they're not out, like just get out. They are reversing from what they believe to something else that they believe. And then we're watching some of those guys. Instead of me, it, look, if in, in honor of you and of God, if, if I was going to apostatize, look, to make me feel comfortable, I would try to get you to go with me. See, once apostasy takes place or, the, or the, uh, uh, the, the beginning of apostasy begins to take place, we, we believe that we truly have learned or been taught something else and we desire that everybody should know. It'd be a revelation. I could say God has revealed to me in His Word this truth that we have been wrong on for all of these years. And we would have to say, collectively, let's look at that. 
And so they're not just leaving those churches. They're apostatizing the whole church. I told somebody the other day, there's a, there's a movement right now. If you will call them, they will, give you, they will give you funding. They will purchase your building. They will give the pastor retirement. And so there are, there are independent Southern Baptist guys that are, le- are leaving and they're grabbing on to this movement because there's safety in that. They can say, well, we can say we are this and just still be a Bible-preaching church. But they, to me, they are counterfeiting what they're doing. And I don't believe God's in that deception either. I mean, we just trust the Lord. Just trust the Lord. God has a retirement plan for you. God has a plan for the church. God has a, a plan for the future. We just trust the Lord. Look, COVID has done this in great masses. This churches could not pay their bills. And so in, in a, you know, a punting situation, they panicked, punted, and now the face of their church is no longer going to be that. And, and what happens to the sheep? A few will stay. The majority will scatter. And then those people, a lot of those people, and it it does boggle your mind, they will not land back in a Bible preaching church. They'll just be out altogether. He was a deacon in a church for 20 years. Now he doesn't go at all. It's a mess. It's a mess. But we're seeing that apostasy, that reversal. I mean, I say in great masses. I think it is in great masses. People are confused. And they've been confused by Satan. They've been confused by, to me, by a small group of men. Even in our circle, the Independent Baptist Circle, there's a small group of men that have stranglehold what everybody perceives that Independent Baptists are. I was having a conversation with with, uh, uh, Caleb's friend just right after the service. He asked me, he goes, are you this or are you this? He tried to put me into an ism category because that's what he's been taught. And we stood right out there in the parking lot and I said, I'm not this and I'm not that. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I'm not a follower of any man. I'm not a follower of any man's teaching. Uh, Those verses that I I preached on this morning... uh, Bill Lancaster left me his uh, Ironside commentary. It's huge. It's marked up. He's read it front to back. I mean, he has spent lots of time. And they said, I'd like to leave you my Ironside commentary. We'd be interested in having it. I said, yeah. So the, so the other night I pulled out uh, John chapter 2, and I thought it'd be neat to read John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. See what Ironside said. And I, this is kind of corny of me. But I was like, Bill's eyes will have read this verse. Now my eyes will have read this verse, and maybe I will better see how he saw this verse. I went. Ironside had no commentary on those three verses. And I was like, well, so much for that. <laughs> so back to my stuff, you know, and off I, off I went. Uh, the correction in area is a, there is a, uh, the, the great apostasy must occur. There shall not, not, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. We see apostasy occurs in every age, but this refers to the great apostasy predicted by Christ in Matthew 24 and previously taught by Paul to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2. Our day gives scary evidence, this is just my rambling, that the great apostasy, and I wrote beginning, but I mean it's just far beyond beginning. I mean, we're, we're in the throes of it. I think with, with I wrote two things, I think. With Israel in, in its land, when was that, 1967? 48? 67 was what, Six-Day War? 48, 1948, with Israel in their land. I know that's, some of you are like, that's a long time ago. It's not that long ago. So with Israel in their land, was that, is it very long ago? I thought it was that year. Okay, so... <laughs> So in 1948, I mean, it, it, in the conception of countries, states, it wasn't that long ago, but with Israel in their land and the calling back of Jews to their land, we see that one thing. Let me get back, back to my notes. Mm, with Israel in their land and apostasy increasing, I, this is my observation. Bible believers cannot help but conclude that the end time is closing in. And, and it has been the end time, but the end of the end time, the last chapter 
of the book. Things that are coming to pass. So we see the great apostasy must occur. The coming of the Antichrist must occur. Man, who has not tried to guess who that is? I mean, there's been presidents gone by that people have just assumed were... Do you believe he's the Antichrist? Do you believe he's the Antichrist? I hear people talk about what he'll look like, where he'll be born, what, the things that he will say, the things that he will do. And they're just like, do you think he's the Antichrist? Do you think he's the Antichrist? There are a lot of Antichrists, the Bible says. They are Antichrist. But this individual is going to begin to gain in influence and in power. And he says, and I wrote, apostasy occurs in every age. Our day is scary. The coming of the Antichrist must occur. Paul gives a brief description of this Antichrist to emphasize that the Antichrist to them in 1 Thessalonians has not yet come. The character of the man, he's a man of sin. (laughs) The Antichrist is not only no Christian, but he's no moralist either. He is wicked. You You guys are with me. Facebook may be censoring us. But you guys see that, I mean, there is just open sin in politics, people of power, and there is no recourse for it whatsoever. And I'm not, and I, and I'm saying on both sides of the aisle, there just is open, blatant corruption. And they pretty much have said, there's nothing you can do about it. We have so much money, so much power, So much influence. Boy, it's a dangerous place for any human to be. We have all of these things. Makes you respect Paul the more. Um, And I think sometimes Christ used him best on house arrest. Because who knows what Paul might have been had he just been loose. Because he would have just gained an authority and an influence. So the character of the man, he is, no, he is no Christian or moralist. He is wicked. And the commendation of him, the son of perdition, this term, uh, uh, this term because it applied to Judas Iscariot, John 17, 12, has caused some to think the Antichrist is Judas. He's going to come back. But all this term does is show the predicted condemnation of the man. The word perdition means that around him there is entire loss. You know what he's going to do? He creates chaos so he can have a one world economy. He creates chaos so he can have a one world religion. He creates, and you see how that works? Out of chaos, he produces uh, this calmness and authority. He creates the chaos, and then he says, But if you come to me, I'll give you a mark. You can buy, sell, and trade. And we and I will supply all your needs. You know what? You know who someone that is that supplies all your needs according to his riches and glory? It's Christ. It's not, it's not uh, the son of perdition. But this is his, this is his, this is how he's going to create it. God creates uh, life through Christ. He creates a lack of chaos, but peace between God and man. Satan creates chaos between man and his stuff. And then he says, and I can fix that chaos. He has power, but he does not have the power of God. So a great apostasy must occur. The coming of the Antichrist must occur. The man of sin, the son of perdition. Uh, Did I have C's? Yeah, the character, the condemnation, and the claims of man who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He claimed to be God by adverseness. This is this chaos. Opposing and thus replacing God by arrogance. I mean, he's arrogantly going to take his place. What will happen to those that oppose him? He'll just put them to death. And so he's going to do it by... uh, 
by arrogance, exalting himself above God by adoration. This is with his power, worship to God by appearance. You can imagine the days of Nebuchadnezzar, man, when he had, he had the, the gardens and the, and the walls, uh, the hanging gardens and the walls and the power that he had. And when he told those people, here's a statue and everybody's going to bow to it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't bow. You can only imagine when... Thousands upon thousands of people took their knee and there were three boys back there, or three men back there that just said, no, he was like, you will, I will bend your will to the ground. I will break you to the ground. You know what we're going to do? We're all going to go over to the furnace and these guys that won't bow, I will cook them to a crisp and you will bow. And what? God showed himself strong on their behalf. They did not bow their knee. And he says in every generation there are those that will not bow their knee to Baal. They will not bow their knee to this worldly God. He has a remnant. Their claims. He's going to be worshipped as God by appearance because of where He sits in the temple of God on that throne. There are going to be those that are around Him that have great power that they're given to Him, and that He is given to them. The council in Erebus speaks of the spiritual council and instruction He gave as the Thessalonians on His ministry at Thessalonica. The message, when I was yet with you, the memory, remember not, we talked about that. The Thessalonians have forgotten much of Paul's teaching. And I just wrote this, and I've already preached it. Repetitive false teaching can do this. Influence of education power can do this. Convincing others to testify of this error can create belief. What is the salesman perpetrating on us? Look, when we kicked God out of the door of the schoolhouse, period. Let's just say this about COVID this year. If you were a Christian and you wanted God in school, this was your year. I mean, every single day you could have read the Bible had devotions. But God didn't create the school to teach children about God. That's, a, that's an ordination of the home. I'm the steward of that child that God has gifted me, not the school. School has made it convenient for education. Come home from the war and they appointed... Dewey Decimal System guy, John or James Dewey, John Dewey, and somebody that we just got done defending. I'm going to take heat for this, but that's fine. You need to go do your history work. And uh, Dr. Seuss, they appointed them two guys to control the masses. All of that stuff was government put out. Going to have an agrarian type school teaching where we put everybody in and we, we control the thinking of the masses. It didn't start out like that. But man, when your science teacher is an atheist and hates God, you definitely aren't going to get a very clear perspective of two positions. And when the public school says, we teach evolution, but we will not teach creation, it says one thing to me, not that they are certain of evolution, but they don't want the influence of creation. If they were certain of evolution, creation would have no effect on what they taught. But there's no certainty of it. That'll be a mess for me after a while. We see, then secondly, finishing this enlightenment. The enlightenment about end time teaching. And we see in verses 6 through 12, which we just were verse 6 and 7, and that's all I'll cover, we'll, we see the restrainer. He's teaching them in, in this order because he's, he's about to tell them, look, as long as you exist on earth, the restrainer is here. It, can, it cannot, the son of perdition cannot be revealed and take his throne until that influence is pulled away. Regardless of when you think it's going to happen, that influence of the Holy Spirit or restrainer has to be 
removed so Satan can do what? Have his way. And we can't imagine. I heard somebody say today at the dinner table, dinner table imagine. I mean, I, and I have an imagination. Uh, the older I get, the less I imagine. Sam will say something, and he'll say, come on, Dad, have an imagination. He'll say that to me, and I'm like, I don't have time for imagining things. Like, things are concrete. Let's get this done. Let's not think about it. Imagine it. Like, put that board there. Put that nail in it. Do Put that wood on there. Cut that angle. Cut. You know, I'm just like, we can talk about imagining later. In verse 6 and 7, in verse 6 it says, "We hold, Withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. He, he who now letteth will let until be taken out of the way. Paul reports that, that there has been some restraining work going on that has kept the Antichrist from being manifested and the work of sin from coming to fruition in the Antichrist's evil. He, had, he has influence. The restrainer's influence is very large, but it is limited. Now, I'm, I'm, and, not, and I'm careful with that word. If, if the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, who we're speaking of, the restrainer's influence is very large, but it's limited, and we could say it's limited by God. To me, it's limited by man's production of the Holy Spirit. Look, as a time of apostasy takes place, and people turn from the teachings of God, the influence of the Christian... Look, if you go to work tomorrow and there's 10 of you there and you are the Bible-believing Christian that says this is what the Bible says and there are five other church-going Christians that do not know their Bible but they read a lot of books that other men produce and they begin to teach something that's contrary to God's Word, you won't win. Their influence wins. And then what do we do to the lost? We are contrary one to the other, and they just say, forget it all. Forget it all. Why do I want what you got? It's a mess. You guys are a mess. Let me say, it's a mess. It's a mess. And all week, all week, it's, it's Christians online in our ministry groups arguing with one another about what is right and who is right. And like, spend your time using your lips to tell other people about Jesus Christ. Man, stop fighting with one another. The effort and energy, I'm going to spend all my time so I can prove, I'm dealing with this, so I can prove that Aaron is wrong. There's error in that. Just preach the Word. Preach the Word. Teach the Word. Teach what God's Word says. It's a spirit of Antichrist. And if he and I can't get it together, you know what happens when we go out into the world to fight for the Lord? There's just no power. The message is flawed. All those Jews come out of captivity, went back with Nehemiah uh, to the city. They were arguing amongst themselves, and God literally just said to them, I cannot change or transform the world if I cannot get you guys on the same page. The people around you are laughing at you. You're just another lowercase r in the religious mess. Look, be, if we're going to be coined religious, then let's be coined right in our religion where we love one another. So we see... His influence, the restrainer's influence is large but limited. It is large, withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. He's withholding this revelation. The restrainer prevents the work of sin from its culmination in the Antichrist until it is God's time for it to occur. The restrainer is very powerful, for it is restraining the forces of evil. The, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, but it cannot climax until the restrainer stops restraining. The mystery of iniquity especially involves the work of the Antichrist. As long as me and you are here and we are know and we know the truth, you know, it's, it's revealing to them that this day has not taken place. You are here because of that. You are here. You and I are here. We're awaiting. So we see... It is large, it is limited, until he be taken out of the way. The restrainer one day will be removed, and then the manifestation of sin will take place. And I wrote, uh, was it in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. The day will come when God will allow men to have their wicked way. And man, and what an awful day that will be. 
He will not, he will not wrestle against man. He will say what? See, in my picture, he's calling the church home. The marriage supper of the Lamb's taking place. There are now two different timelines. There's one going on in heaven, while one being unleashed on earth. And because all of that's been removed, man, man is just getting to do what? That which is right in his own eyes. I mean, there will be no restrainer. You guys see that in like the, how the law enforcement is being absolutely gutted. And, and, be honest, and a few bad apples. And there's probably a bunch of bad apples. Uh, stain the masses of the law enforcement. You know how a few people have turned on its head uh, every city uh, in this country? You know, I, I, I'm watching people, though, awake to what's going on, white and black. They're awaking to it. They're seeing it. And I'm not saying it's too little, too late. But, beloved, things in, this, in America, they never get morally better. At best, they hold until we take our next level of depth. And you guys, some of you may have lived through a time when things got morally better, where you felt that way. It's not been our experience. not been my experience. In my life as an adult, that has not been the experience. And I've got lots to say, but I'd make you mad. And I don't want to do that. So the restrainer, we see his influence, and then we see his, the restrainer, we see his identity. He who letteth now let restrains, he will let restrain. Who is the restrainer? We believe it's the Holy Spirit. His removal will recur when you and I are absent or taken away from the earth. If the Spirit of God indwells the church, and I wrote a big old capital I, capital F, if, because I believe the Spirit of God has written Ichabod on many congregations, churches, places of worship. Because I'm just being honest and, not, and I'm not trying to end your Sunday night with leaving out of here with depression. But he's not welcome there anymore. They don't preach about him. Worship is man centered, preaching is man felt. There's nothing centers around Christ anymore. It centers around His creation. We've always thought that he, they will love the creation more than the Creator. We've always kind of linked that to people loving animals and they have a great... It's, it's me. It's me. We love, love the creation more than we do the Creator. We think by bringing in the big name speakers, we will stir the heart of God. And it just ain't true. It just ain't true. Let's find somebody with an influence with God on their life and let's let them just encourage us to walk with God. Big, big names, they don't impress God. When God walks in the room, He's the big name. When Christ comes into our presence, He's the big name. And nobody ushers that in. I think because we think we can influence it, because we can quench it. What was the word was in our, when it was in our... Uh, Ephesians 4 this morning, not quench. Um, grieve. I think because we believe that we can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit, we have control over then Him in the other direction. Not so. Don't quench, don't grieve. Just let Him have His way. Let Him have His way. So second, it is limited until He be taken away. The fact that they... We're still here, I believe, was a testimony that the day of Christ had not yet come. And judgment of mankind, the day of the Lord, were not being fulfilled while they were still here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, For God had not appointed them, He had revealed to them unto wrath. You know, He had said, Look, you guys are under great persecution. I understand that. Where truth is, persecution has taken place. You know, where life is, Death is in pursuit of it. And so as long as we're serving the Lord, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, it's easier. I think those verses, I, I had them this morning. I didn't read them. Uh, Any man set his hand to the plow and look back, 
is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. That was that uh, teros, that very first uh, miracle where we're like, yay, Lord, and we get enamored by the things of the world. Demas hath forsaken me, love in this present evil world. You know, uh, so any man sits his hand to the plow and looks back, just not fit for the kingdom of God. What should we do? Just keep plowing your rows. Hey, hey, it'll all be over soon. It'll all be over soon. You say, man, that's not much consolation. Heaven is. Heaven's the prize, friend. I mean, being in the presence of Christ, there's lots of prizes. Being in paradise where Christ is, that's the prize. There aren't prizes here. I, I look at that verse, it probably was the most de depressing truths, revealings that's in God's Word that God has shown me in the book of Hebrews when it says, they all died not receiving the promise. And I was like, what? And God spoke to my heart and said, you do your part. So Caleb and Aaron and Nathan, Sam, Grace, Shelby, Savannah, you do your part so they can do their part. And then I'm going to bring you home. Well, that's a lot of work. Yeah, and it's not always whistle while we work work either. Some of it's very depressing and heavy. But God does what? He bears us up on the wings of eagles. A threefold cord's not easily broken. We just carry on for the Lord. I asked the boys just a while back, think about this question. I asked Caleb this, I asked Nathan that, in a few years I'll ask Sam the same. Me and Caleb riding down the road and I just said, you're going to serve the Lord your whole life? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I said, you're going to go to church like Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, your whole life, read your Bible your whole life, sing those same hymns over and over your whole life, listen to preaching your whole life, Sing about the Lord your whole life. And he was like, maybe I awakened something because now he's thinking about doing something else for his whole life. But he just was like, but that's, what else would I do, Dad? And I was like, okay, well, that satisfies me. You know, that's what I want to hear. I mean, that doesn't guarantee it. But we think our whole life is a long time. It's not very long. It's but a vapor. Yeah. We'll be home soon. Me and you will be on the streets of glory soon. Somebody else can be man in this stuff, woman in this stuff, taking care of what's going to happen next, who's going to preach what next, what's going to be sung next, all that, all those decisions, what day we're going to have next, where we're going to have it, is it going to be big enough? All, somebody else is going to make all those decisions and we're going to be home in glory, thanking the Lord that we just finished our course and we're in the presence of God. But until this time, don't be weary in well-doing because in due season, you and I, man, we'll reap if we faint not. Put your seed in the ground. Pull the weeds. Wait for the fruit to break through. Fertilize that thing so it will produce fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we thank you for tonight, your word. Lord, even as we study these truths, Lord, I think about how much chaos and teaching there is that surrounds these things. Lord, I pray ultimately we would not worship at the feet of our beliefs, but Lord, we would worship at Your feet. Lord, I pray You would even reveal to us the places that we stumble or misunderstand. Lord, those influences that have brought us to this point. And Lord, we would come to an understanding of Your truth. I pray for those, Lord, that are in our midst, in our congregation and visiting, that, that have heard so many things about Christ. Lord, I pray that Your revelation here, Your person would be clearly taught. And those individuals can at least have a taste of what true biblical truth is, Lord. Help me, Lord, as I navigate my personality, my influences, my likes. Help me to follow you 
trust you, be led of your Spirit. Lord, let us not be destroyed by what we see coming, but Lord, be filled with anticipation for that wonderful day when we get to come home and be with you for all of eternity. We love you. Lord, teach us to love you more right and better, and you'll get the praise for what's done in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.